Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. If you're hearing this, then you're on the public feed, which means you'll get episodes a week after they come out and you'll hear advertisements. You can gain access to the subscriber feed by going to colemanhughes.org and becoming a supporter. This means you'll have access to episodes a week early, you'll never hear ads, and you'll get access to bonus Q&A episodes. You can also support me by liking and subscribing on YouTube and sharing the show with friends and family. As always, thank you so much for your support. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. Before I introduce my guest today, I want to remind you all as the holiday season approaches that you can buy Conversation with Coleman's merchandise for yourself or your loved ones at colemanhughes.org. We have a hoodie, a mug, a t-shirt, and a face mask, so go check that out. Okay, my guest today is Michelle Telfer. Michelle is an Australian pediatrician and head of the gender clinic at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. She's the lead author of the Australian Standards of Care and Treatment Guidelines for Trans Children, and she is also a former Olympic gymnast. In this episode, we talk about gender dysphoria, particularly in children and adolescents. We talk about the difference between puberty blockers, hormone therapy, and surgery, as well as the complications of all three. As I say to Michelle, the size of my podcast audience basically guarantees that someone listening is either trans themselves or the parent of a trans kid. And so I hope this episode is useful to them as well as interesting to everyone else. I'm especially concerned about the process by which it's decided that a young person should undergo irreversible medical operations. Michelle is very much on the inside of this process, and I came away pleasantly surprised by the degree of rigor at her clinic. There are two ways to mess this up. First, by making it too easy for teens and preteens to make irreversible changes to their bodies, thereby guaranteeing that some of them will forever live with regrets. And second, by making it too difficult for trans kids to make the kinds of changes that will give them a shot at happiness. That's the tightrope we have to walk on this issue, and from what I can tell, Michelle is successfully walking it. So without further ado, Michelle Telfer. All right, Michelle Telfer, thanks so much for coming on my show. Thank you, Coleman. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So um, I I guess let's just start with your background. Um, How did you start doing the work that you do and and how was the clinic born? Well, I'm a pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist. So I went through medical school and then uh, trained for pediatrics over another six years. And um, then I did some extra training in adolescent medicine and became a specialist in this field. With the gender service, it was an interesting um, start for me. I I took a new role here at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne in Australia and uh, at the start of this this job, um, which was a full-time role, um, there was a situation where uh, there were about 15 patients in the hospital who were receiving treatment um, for their trans and gender diverse identity And the endocrinologist who was looking after them had um, decided to retire and there wasn't anyone else who was stepping forward to take over the care of these young people. And so what I did was uh, put my hand up and said, um, look, I'm not an expert in this area, um, but I'm willing to learn and and to work out um, something something new and, and it fit really well into adolescent medicine because um, these are young people with um, often coming in in distress and with uh, concerns about their mental health and yet the care that we provide for them is a, a mixture between mental health support and, and care but also physical um, medical interventions to help them affirm their gender. So for adolescent medicine physicians, this was an area that we could use our expertise. So I uh, did a lot of reading, met lots of people, and then started to see these young people and by listening to them and to listening to their stories and hearing what they needed, um, I was able to learn how best to do this work. Yeah, so... 
This is a, uh, it, it's, a, it's, um, it's a charged and, and controversial topic as, as you're well aware. And it's the, the, the reason it's at all sort of an ethically interesting topic or important topic to discuss is, is because we're talking about, you know, children, children having to make decisions about, you know, their health and medical interventions. No one really or should really care so much what an, what an adult does to their body because uh, cause they're the only real stakeholder and we know the adult mind has matured enough to make certain kinds of decisions. But trans children face a, uh, a very tricky sort of catch-22 almost like paradox where if in order to have a shot at having the, the body they see themselves in, they need to start with medical interventions uh, before puberty. At, at the very least, puberty blockers. But precisely because they're that young, uh, we can't. We have to have a some kind of standard to allow them to make those kinds of decisions. That's that's different than what we would require of an adult, which is, you know, really not not much at all. And so I think, especially, you know, and anyone with kids. I don't have kids yet, but I but I plan to one day. You know, parents are imagining what what do I do when my 10-year-old, 11-year-old, or, or five-year-old, for that matter, comes to me and says, you know, mommy, I'm a boy, mommy, I'm a girl. And, and you know, so like, it, do you interpret that initially? Do you just wait and see? Um, so th- this is the kind of, this is the predicament that many parents are in and all parents probably imagine themselves can imagine themselves being in. And what I find interesting about you, you know, obviously the, the biggest concern a parent would have is that uh, this is just a phase. I don't want my kid to do something that's irreversible or go through any kind of medical procedure that they're going to grow out of. And um, so, so that's, I think the main concern and your clinic and and really any responsible clinic has you know addresses this concern pretty pretty straight on in that there's a there's a a system of of meetings and education that you know d- doesn't just that weans out the the kids for whom who are not really trans in a, 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 as a stable identity and only applies treatment to to those that are not going to regret it so I think that's that's a very interesting and important feature here that I want you to walk walk me through. So like day one, my kid has shown, has told me that they're trans and I bring them into your clinic. What is the process like from the very beginning? Yeah, and Coleman, look, you've just touched on um, many of the issues that we face on a on a daily basis and many of the questions we get from parents too about what do I do in this situation that I find myself in? Um, one of the, I think the key concepts before we get into the process of what we do is that when we talk to these young people, whether it's a very young child and we have referrals that come in from families where the child is as young as three years old to referrals that we get from those who are mid and late adolescents, is that for them it doesn't, Uh, it doesn't feel like a choice. So for these young people that are are in a situation where they feel their gender doesn't align with their sex that was assigned at birth, for them it isn't a choice about um, do I live in this way, do I transition or do I face the world expressing myself as I need need to. Um, It's often an absolute inner desire to do so and and if they're not able to express themselves in that way if they're unable to be genuine about who they are and show their authentic self it's highly highly distressing for them Um, so what what is important for us is that we first of all listen to the young person and the parents um, because obviously important to consider their 
um, the situation as a family and, and the environment that they're living in. But we listen and hear uh, from them uh, what they need to be happy and fulfilled um, and to function well as, as a person and as a family. So that's the first main point. And I have to say that of, of the hundreds, of, we've, we've seen thousands of young people through our clinic, the stories are never the same. So each person that comes in has their own story and their own set of circumstances. And there isn't a cookie cutter kind of approach to this. We have a very well prescribed system um, that's multidisciplinary and involves clinicians across mental health, psychology and psychiatry, social work. We have um, paediatricians and endocrinologists and gynecologists. We have so many different specialists. And whilst everyone has access to whoever they need, uh, some need um, input from uh, some specialties more than others. Um, some people are very sure, some people are really unsure, and um, some people feel a real sense of urgency that something has to be done, and others don't want anything to be done. They just want to come in and talk and try and help understand how they're feeling. So to get back to your question, Coleman, sorry, it was a very long-winded way of um, preempting it, but uh, when we receive a referral, it depends on how old the young person is to how we approach it. So, for example, if someone is three or four years of age, um, of course, there's not going to be any intervention as such, apart from really talking to that child and um, watching them play and and see seeing them interact with their family members and discussing with their parents what they need to feel supported, whichever way it may go, whether this young person identifies as trans and, and grows up and wants to transition or whether this is something um, that they're expressing now um, that may evolve in another way. Um, so for a three or four-year-old, it's just really um, we assign them a, a person to talk to, usually a psychologist or psychiatrist, and then they take um, that journey um, with, with adjustments over the years for what they may need. If someone comes in and they're uh, pre-pubertal in that peripubertal age, so somewhere between 8 and 13, um, then we take a different approach because um, it's at that time that they may be expressing that they'd really like to start on puberty blockers. Um, they may have really intense sense of uh, anxiety, this sort of anticipatory anxiety about what will happen uh, when they go through puberty or they might be on the cusp of puberty or starting puberty where they're experiencing changes of their body where they become extraordinarily distressed. Um, it's around age 11 and 12 that we see a big jump in, in referrals because often um, it's when they start to experience their body changing that they really, under, they, they really experience that sense of um, uh, or sometimes panic or distress that it doesn't feel right for them and um, a sense that they can't stop it. It's, it's, it's progressing, it's outside of their control and they really, really don't want it to happen. Um, so around that age, around that peripubertal age, they uh, are allocated um, a mental health clinician who they see initially for three or four sessions and then they're a paediatrician uh, joins them for the fourth session where we talk about medical options depending on where things are at. And to be honest, for the, for the vast majority, um, it takes longer than that to work through um, what is best for that young person. Um, and, of course, there are um, not just assessments in terms of, of talking and, um, and working out how that young person feels and where they want to go in the future. But we also worry about the medical side of things. So we do blood tests, we check bone density, uh, we talk to them about fertility preservation um, and um, the risks and benefits of doing interventions from, from that perspective and happy to go into detail with that, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, and then there are the older kids, so those that present when they're past puberty, where puberty blockers... Uh, 
aren't really indicated because they're not going to have much impact on, on the physical uh, side of things. But these young people uh, are just as uh, distressed often about how they feel about themselves and have come to the realisation about their trans identity a bit later on. Um, and whilst they are um, distressed and want to transition, they're older and more independent in their um, in their in their kind of living and in their decision making. And whilst we still involve parents at that that age, it becomes much more of a of an interaction uh, between the doctor and the young person, um, where we uh, I guess spend more time with the adolescent just solely on their own um, and try and work through uh, what's going to be best for them. So I think all up, when you look at the amount of time we spend with young people and families, it depends on their age, it depends on their circumstances, depends on their sense of urgency and their mental health status. Um, and we, we adjust um, and individualise to make sure that we get the best outcomes we can. And is, is everyone, are all the patients at your clinic 18 or, or below? When they are referred to us, we accept referrals only if someone is under 17. There's under 17, an, okay. Yeah, there's, a, there's a, an adult service that takes the referrals when they're older than that. Unfortunately for us, we've had this extraordinarily um, large rise in referrals uh, over the last 10 years, which is consistent with gender services across Australia, um, but also across the Western world, where... Um, we haven't been able to keep up with the demand with our current resources. Um, we're very fortunate here in Melbourne that we've got a very supportive government who's just given us um, an increase in, in our funding uh, and we're just about to expand the services, not just at the Royal Children's Hospital, but with our, our partner hospitals and health services. Um, and what we'll be doing is um, is taking this multidisciplinary approach and and expanding it out across Victoria for the for the adolescent age group. Um, but uh, what we what we're finding is that with this increase in demand, there's become there has um, developed long waiting lists, and um, unfortunately, whilst we've got this uh, sort of complex uh, a collaborative multidisciplinary approach, many young people are spending a long period of time waiting to get into those services. Um, and whilst we're linking them in with community-based services uh, for mental health to try and make sure that they're safe from uh, a self-harm perspective um, and to start working through some of the concerns they may have with COVID pandemic, uh, there's been a huge demand on mental health services across the country. Sure, it's actually uh, an international phenomenon and um, it's increasingly difficult to, to access that care. All right, so I, I do want to get into the, the specifics here and I think just uh, it's just worth saying that, you know, the audience of my podcast is now large enough. I, could, I can confidently say somebody listening to this episode is you know either in this situation themselves or has a child who is is precisely in this situation. So um, you know th that's just always good to keep in mind. Um, so let's just go over the difference between puberty blockers and and hormone therapy. Okay, so. Puberty blockers are medications that um, uh, they're otherwise known as uh, gonadotrophin-releasing hormone analogs, um, and they what they do is act on the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland and block the hypothalamic uh, pituitary gonadal axis. So it's a very medical explanation um, for essentially blocking the pathway that allows the body to produce estrogen or testosterone. And regardless of whether you're assigned female or male at birth, these medications act in the same way on the brain and ultimately stop the testes from producing testosterone or the ovaries from producing estrogen. And when a young person is started on 
puberty blockers, usually given uh, by intramuscular injection or a subcutaneous implant, depending on the type of medic the type of blocker you're using. Uh, what it does is essentially suppress these uh, hormones, which allows the body to continue to, to grow and, and develop in all other ways. Um, they grow taller, they put on weight, they continue to do um, uh, well or, or at the same level, I should say, academically and cognitively, but they don't develop the secondary sexual characteristics of um, for those assigned female at birth. They don't develop breasts, for example. They don't start to menstruate. For those who are assigned male at birth, uh, being on puberty blockers stops their voice deepening, stops them growing facial hair and, um, and stops the changes associated with masculinisation of the jaw and face. And they can continue to, to as I said, to grow up um, without those physical changes in the body. And what we see with puberty blockers uh, very often when a young person has come into us um, expressing a huge amount of distress with, with development um, of their secondary sexual characteristics, that starting on the blockers um, almost instantaneously reduces that anxiety and allows them to function in a way um, that uh, enables them to attend school, for example, and concentrate on, on, on learning um, and enables them to, um, to, to function in the home environment without being so distressed. Um, they're happier and um, just, yeah, they're happier, their mental health is better. With um, hormone treatment, um, in terms of gender-affirming hormone treatment, we use uh, testosterone for those who have a male gender identity and testosterone induces masculinization. So um, for that, you see a, a deepening of the voice, often within six to eight weeks initially, um, and other changes that uh, progress over a number of years. So changes in jaw fa uh, and facial structure to be more masculine, facial hair, body hair, um, and also sort of increase in, in muscularity of the body and changes in uh, fat redistribution. So instead of um, putting fat, for example, on the hips and, and the bottom, as one would being assigned female at birth with testosterone, you tend to have a narrowing of, um, of the fat in those areas. And when they, if they do put on weight, it tends to be on, on the abdomen. So you get a masculine um, overall appearance over over many years, and with estrogen, um, what we see is the the opposite. We have the feminization of the body with breast growth, um, widening of 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 uh, hips through fat redistribution, softening of the skin, softening of the of the facial features, um, and enabling um, them uh, to. I guess, express themselves in a way that they feel fits with their inner sense of who they are. And with the physical changes, what we tend to see uh, for the vast majority is an improvement in their mood, in, um, uh, in their levels of anxiety and, um, and their ability to kind of do well in life uh, more broadly. So a key difference between these two things is that puberty blockers are, you know, if you, if you decide to stop taking them, the puberty you were going to have naturally is, is just going to kick back in. Yeah, that's right. So puberty so blockers. It's more, it's more of a puberty delayer really than a, yeah, than a blocker. Yeah, we, yeah, we refer, we refer to it um, medically as puberty suppression mm -hmm. uh, because it does, it suppresses puberty for a period of time. And um, if you do choose to come off puberty blockers, then you're right, your endogenous hormones kick in again and, um, and the puberty that you would have experienced before happens a bit later on. Mm -hmm. And this is a really important uh, point common because with puberty blockers, um, sometimes what we see are young people who come in um, extraordinarily uh, distressed and, and extraordinarily anxious to the point that they can't speak about what's happening 
to their body and to them and it's um and their function in terms of their environment at home and at school is is so poor because of this distress and anxiety that often we um, offer to start the puberty blockers to allow them space to uh and the time space and the time to to talk without a sense of urgency over a decision yeah. i can give you an example i look after uh a young person who came to see us uh, when um, when he was um, about ten, um, and he was really unsure of of his gender, um, and he had uh, an, a number of very feminine interests. He was very feminine in his expression generally. But he said, "I really, I'm not sure that I'm female." I, I could. I think I'm male. I'm not sure. Um, I really don't know. Maybe I'm non-binary. Maybe I'm not exclusively male or female. And he also had um, uh, such severe anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder that his whole day was made up of rituals to try and control this anxiety. So we offered to put him on puberty blockers just so that he didn't have to make a decision so urgently. And it was really interesting to watch the anxiety. Um, really, um, it took time, but it, it settled down. He stopped uh, spending much of the day doing hand washing and checking things, which were part of his OCD uh, symptomatology. And what we saw over time was him become much more comfortable um, with himself and he uh, in the end after about three years said I do feel very comfortable now that I'm male I'm a very feminine um, male um, not yet aware of potential kind of sexuality and, and identification in other ways um, but he said for my gender I now feel much more comfortable and I'm going to come off the blockers and go through male puberty. And um, this young person has gone from not being able to function at school to now I heard actually just a couple of weeks ago that he's got a scholarship um, into uh, year 11, which is our kind of uh, last two years of high school, year 11 and 12, and he's been able to um yeah to do so well academically he's mm. moved schools into into somewhere where he's got a scholarship so puberty blockers can work for trans people in suppressing puberty and allow a transition um that enables them to express themselves in their trans identity but it, they can also help young people by providing space to work through some of their concerns and um and to do so i think in a really humane way where um, they feel a sense of control um, that they wouldn't have otherwise had. Yeah, this this brings up an, an interesting point, which uh, you know the the more the more I've had conversations with people who either are trans and have transitioned or are are cisgender but had you know struggled with some degree of gender dysphoria in their youth. I've come more and more to see gender dysphoria as a, as a spectrum or as something that comes in degrees where you have some kids that, you know, f- from the moment they can speak are sure and, and just completely stable in the sense that they are assigned the wrong gender and they sound the same way about it when they're two years old as they do when they're 15. And, and then you have people that just have a, a slight dose on the other end of the spectrum, a slight dose of discomfort with their gender that isn't isn't ever going to materialize into any, anything worth intervening on. And then you have everything in between. Yeah. And, um, and so I think, it, you know, part of the reason this conversation has been as, you know, as, as sometimes um, needlessly sort of controversial as it is, is because we talk about gender dysphoria as, as something you just either have or you don't. Uh, which I think t- it obscures really the messy reality of of things for people. Yeah, oh, and I completely agree with you that this is a spectrum. And I think we started talking about how everyone has their own story, 
and I don't think I'll ever come across two young people and uh, who are the same. Um, and there is the classic narrative of the trans person who presents at age three who, as soon as they could speak, talked about their gender in a way um, that uh, clearly, clearly identifies them as having a trans identity. And yet we have uh, young people who first come to a realisation in puberty or, or first start to really think about their gender identity as adults. Um, and you hear of people transitioning. Uh, we certainly um, in Australia have stories of people transitioning at 70 and 80 years of age um, that have uh, experienced uh, gender dysphoria and their own sense of who they are over time may have needed their circumstances to be in a, to be such that it did feel safe for them to transition. Um, but there are there are people who are at each end of the spectrum, and then, as you say, everyone in the middle. Um, and that nuance gets lost, I think, when um, the discussion about trans people is politicised, and um, when the the controversy comes, it's often not controversy uh, which is looking at nuance. It's the controversy of uh, you know good and uh, good and bad, black and white. Um, people try and reduce it to that sort of debate, and I think that's where it gets. Um, dangerous for trans people. Yeah. So, um, so it's just one more question about uh, puberty blockers. I understand the only you know side effect that is, that is long term is a decrease in bone density. Mm. So, how how serious is that? Yeah. Um, good question. Um, so. Puberty blockers or puberty suppression, the medications don't directly affect bone. So it's not as if there's a, a side effect where that medication is interacting with the osteocytes, for example, the, mm -hmm. the cells in the bone. But what we know in adolescence is that uh, estrogen and testosterone have a really important function in increasing bone density. And that's why, for example, if someone... Uh, has another condition like anorexia nervosa, let's just throw that in there, where their estrogen is very, very low, their bone density is, um, is affected as well. So it's a similar kind of mechanism where the absence of the, uh, the hormones in the body um, really has an, has an impact um, if that absence is, uh, is extended or long-term. So what we find with puberty blockers is for those who go into puberty really early. So these are often uh, trans boys. We know that those who are assigned female at birth start puberty approximately two years earlier than those who are assigned male at birth. So they'll often be started on puberty blockers from as young as sort of 10 or 11. And if they're not commenced on uh, gender affirming hormones or if their blockers aren't stopped, so they're endogenous hormones can, can enter back into their system, that prolonged period of time um, of absence of hormones in their body will um, affect their bone density. And the effect on bone density is, um, is again, uh, different for each individual. Um, so uh, for anyone that we're starting on puberty blockers, we measure bone density um, and uh, genetics plays a really big role in bone density. Um, so does weight and exercise levels and, and there are many other factors. And so for some, if their bone density is within the normal range or above average when we start puberty blockers and they're not on puberty blockers for very long, then the impact on bone density is actually fairly minimal. And when they do start gender-affirming hormones, what we see is, is a good catch-up in bone density and the studies that have been done show that there is significant catch-up when we start gender-affirming hormones um, and the bone density improves significantly. Um, but it, the studies aren't yet uh, extended out longitudinally. 
to see what happens um, in, the, in the much longer term where we suspect that bone density will continue to accrue and improve over time. So most of the bone density studies look at outcomes of two years after they've started hormone treatment. And we think it's necessary to look at what the bone density is doing five and 10 years after starting hormones to see if that catch up continues. With those who are assigned male at birth, who uh, go into puberty later and have a much shorter period of time between starting the puberty blockers and commencing on um, uh, estrogen, um, the, the impact on why, bone density. Why is that? I'm curious. Uh, sorry, why do they sorry. go into puberty later? Oh, no, no. You said there's a, did I, maybe I misheard you, but there's a, you said there's a usually shorter period of time between when they start puberty blockers and when they start taking estrogen relative oh, to... Y yes, just because the the age that we tend to look at starting them on gender-affirming hormones is around the age that they become competent to make their own decision-making. Right. So for those assigned male and female at birth, it's around the same age. Gotcha. Uh, they tend to become competent around sort of 14 to 16. Um, in their capacity to understand um, long-term risks and benefits and so forth. So mm -hmm. just they're all starting at the same time, but um, with the affirming hormones, but the blockers start at different times. So. Got it. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and in, in the cases where people do just choose to come off the puberty blockers and have the puberty they would have had is does the fact that they went on those blockers change the puberty, like, like the length of it, or it's, it's just just what it would have been, just delayed? Yeah, our, our experience is that it's just delayed mm -hmm. and um, there haven't been any effects um, for the young people that we've looked after where that's happened. We don't have a huge number, to be honest, because the vast majority that start on puberty blockers um, continue to um, to be sure about what they want to do longer term and progress to gender affirming hormones. But um, for the small number who have come off blockers, um, they've done really well. And am I, am I right to some somehow you know, sort of equate this to the experience of like an, an extreme child athlete who's, whose puberty gets delayed just by the amount of exercise they're doing, but then when it comes, it, it comes the same way? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's a fairly good analogy. If you look at, um, yeah, gymnasts, uh, ballet dancers often have low weight and, and really high intensive exercise that can suppress their, um, their production of hormones. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think partly the exercise, um, with the, especially the weight bearing exercise of those sports helps with bone density. Um, so there's, um, yes, lots of different factors there, but, uh, they do go through normal puberty and, um, go on to function well in society. Okay. So now let's talk about hormone therapy. Uh, as I said, the, this is the, 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 the people who make it to this stage have, you know, decided that they're going to make changes to their body that are um, very difficult to reverse, if some of which are impossible to reverse. And so this is a, it requires a much higher level of responsibility to administer these than to administer puberty blockers. Um, so, you know, in what way does it, does it differ to say, take testosterone, for instance, then to, uh, you know, produce it naturally? Is there any significant difference? Is there, are there, is there anything worth worrying about, uh, given the fact that you're taking it exogenously? Um, that is a good question. I think when you're taking it exogenously, it, there are, um, I guess there's a, a level of oversight um, that is required to keep things safe. Um, so, for example, when you're uh, taking the testosterone via injection or you can take it by gel, just on your skin, there's lots of different ways. Um, we do measure testosterone levels in the blood to make sure that 
those levels aren't too high or um, or for some people uh, too low. And it's just something that you don't need to worry about um, when you have endogenous testosterone. Um, and we know that there are risks of having too much testosterone in your system um, in terms of, um, uh, for example, your your haemoglobin, your hematocrit can increase and that can increase the, uh, the risk of clot um, in your blood. Um, if you think about... Um, Often, if we go back to talking about athletes and some of the um, the athletes who take um, performance enhancing drugs, um, one of those performance enhancing drugs is testosterone like um, uh, medications, and that increases your hematocrit um, so that your body can carry more oxygen. So it's really good for cyclists, for example. Totally banned, and I'm not recommending anyone do it, um, but. <laughs> It might help you cycling, but it also increases your risk of having blood clots, um, which can lead to um, heart attacks and strokes. So there are certain things about taking endogenous hormones that require uh, oversight um, or not oversight so much, but monitoring. Um, same with estrogen. Estrogen, as we know, with cisgender females taking the pill, um, whether that's for contraception or, or menstrual management, um, there are risks there in terms of blood clots as well, different mechanism to testosterone, but blood clots are um, a concern. And it's the same for trans women who are taking estrogen as for cis women taking estrogen. We need to make sure that, um, that it's done in a way that's, that's safe and um, taking into account, of course, um, their, their genetics and their family history. Um, and making sure that um, we're not increasing the risk unnecessarily by doing things in a, in, in a way that, that could cause that. So for, for most of your patients, you know, well, once, once they're on either testosterone or estrogen, is there just a, a sort of um, constant dosage that they're on? Uh, is there, does the dosage change over time? How does that work? Yeah. Um, so it depends on the age which they're starting these um, hormone treatments. So if you've had someone who started on puberty suppression fairly early and ha haven't gone through their own endogenous puberty, we would start the dose at a much lower level and very slowly increase that dose in increments so that we're mimicking and endogenous puberty in terms of that uh, progression. Uh, and yet if we had someone who, say, presented to us at 16 or 17 who had already gone through uh, puberty, if we were to start um, hormone therapy at that older age, we'd be more likely to increase the dose much more quickly. Um, it tend to be of bigger size um, and the effect um, of those hormones um, uh, often require higher dosages because of getting towards you know an adult physiology. So we really do take an individual approach, but we do in all cases grade up the dose until we're at a level that um, that person is getting the effect that they need physically and also um, the effect that they need from a mental health perspective. So we balance out those risks and benefits. And then once they're at a level, sort of often there are prescribed maximum doses. Um, once we get uh, close to that or, or, or at that level, um, then it tends to stay fairly constant from there in. What's really interesting, though, Coleman, is that over time what we're seeing is uh, further individualisation of hormone treatments. So, and this has really come from... Um, demand from the community and listening to what uh, the trans community are telling us in terms of what they need. And uh, some people are opting to have hormone treatment for a certain period of time and then to deliberately and in a planned way stop taking it. Um, so I can give you an example of this. So um, someone who, for example, is assigned female at birth and has a non-binary gender identity um, they might come to us and, and say, I, I have a non-binary gender identity and I want to masculinise to a certain extent, um, but I don't want to uh, look sort of in, in a way that 
I'm a man. I want to look uh, not exclusively male or female. I want my body to reflect my non-binary gender identity. And we have the same process. You know, we meet with with them and with their family and we talk through all of the, the short-term, medium-term, long-term kind of um, concerns and plans and dreams and, and wishes and we talk about all the risks and benefits of the different treatments. And some of these young people are opting to have testosterone for a certain amount of time, often about six months, where they want to have a deeper voice and they might um, want also to have some masculinization of their face. Um, but for them, um, they get to a point of masculinization where they feel that's right for them. Um, and then they stop taking testosterone um, so that they have some masculinization, but not too much um, for how they feel they are as a person. And of course, once you stop the testosterone, um, those irreversible changes remain for that person. Um, but their endogenous estrogen then uh, is, is present in the body and is there to assist with um, just the general physiology that uh, requires a hormone in the body. So the bone density and their bone health remains really good. Um, for some, they may. Um, actually want to have uh, menstruation continue. Um, others want us to use other things to stop that. But there are, there are different ways people can use hormone treatments in a safe way to express who they are and to fit with how they see themselves in the world. So we're, we're seeing more and more young people coming to us with, with that idea that um, they don't want the full um, kind of, uh, they don't want the full gamut of, of puberty blockers, gender affirming hormones, and then surgical treatments that they might want a, a little bit of that. Mm. And a number of, um, of young people come to us and say, actually, we don't want hormone treatment at all. We, uh, want to talk through it. We want to understand who we are as a person, um, some young people say, I'm, I want you to help my family understand how I feel. Um, and they may plan to have some surgery in the future, often chest reconstruction surgery to, uh, to change the shape of their chest to be more a non-binary shape rather than, say, a female shape. But they don't have hormone treatment. They never plan to. And they want to live their life um, with, yeah, with that aspect. Um, that's addressed and, and nothing else. So it's just so individual. Yeah. And did, did, is everything that, that's happening here, does it all require parental approval? And, and then, you know, in, in the cases where, are, are there cases where people's parents come in and you can see that they're totally uncomfortable with what's going on um, and, and there's some kind of sort of conflict that you have to help the family through? Yeah, look, I think a lot of the time we spend as uh, clinicians in the gender service is spent with parents and helping them to understand uh, where the young person is at. Um, we know that someone's identity is, um, is, is not changeable. We, we all have our own identity and, and that changes over time um, from an internal kind of inherent perspective, um, but no one can change another person's identity. Um, and uh, when we think about um, uh, practices uh, in the past for, um, for we, we, people undertook things like conversion therapy or um, um, various mechanisms to try and to change one's gender identity, we know that that has never worked. Um, just like you can't make someone trans um, if they're not trans, you can't make someone cisgender if, if they're not cisgender. And um, with families coming into the gender service, um, often there's a, um, a sense of, um, there's often a sense of distress um, that they, they worry um, about uh, the young person, even if they're very supportive of the young person and, and understand their trans experience, they might really worry about 
how the world is going to respond uh, to them because many parents are very aware of the stigma, the discrimination, the social exclusion, rejection, abuse, uh, harassment uh, that occurs in trans people and parents often come in and say, um, I'm worried about my child and how they are going to cope in a world that treats trans people in this way. Um, and yet other parents come in and um, and want us to, to fix things in a certain way where it's not something that needs to be fixed um, because the young person is, is who they are and, and we have to try and spend time and provide education around um, helping them to understand their child's experience but to come to a situation where the, fa the family have a shared experience about the child and or the young person. And that can take a very long period of time um, but it's so important because the, the primary prognostic factor when it comes to outcomes for trans youth are the support of those around them and families are number one. And parents will often come to us and say, um, it's, it's a big shock to me. I had no idea that this has come out of the blue. And what you hear when you talk to that young person is that they've been thinking about this sometimes for years um, and they might have told some friends or they might have been using avatars online that are consistent with their gender identity, but they've been afraid to talk to their parents um, because they've been afraid that they'll be rejected by the people that they love the most. Um, so often it takes that time to build up the courage to uh, come out to their parents and their siblings. And that's where we as, as doctors and clinicians can assist in, in helping that communication and assisting um, people to understand. In terms of your, um, your question about parental involvement in decision-making, for all of those reasons, we always involve parents in decision making. But sometimes there are situations where um, where parents are very fixed in their view and may be absolutely um, certain that um, that they will never support their young person uh, to live in their trans identity or express their gender as as trans. Um, and in those situations, it's very, very difficult for us because um, we see the harm that can be done with doing nothing, um, that doing nothing is not a neutral option um, because doing nothing denies a young person the care they need. And sometimes those consequences can be, um, can be fatal. Um, there's... Um, very good um, and there's very good research which has been replicated um, in a number of studies in Australia um, in recent years. Um, trans uh, sorry, the, um, the trans pathway study was done uh, in 2017 looking at um, a large number of young people across the whole of Australia in that age of sort of 14 to 25 and um, of that group, um, eighty percent had self harmed at some stage, and forty eight percent had attempted suicide. And we've got similar data from a recent study that's been done in twenty twenty one called Writing Themselves in Four, uh, where very very high risk of of, of self harm and suicide. So when you have a young person who comes in with uh, parents who are denying them treatment, and where that young person can't see a future for themselves uh, living in their authentic self, um, they have very high risk. And occasionally we, we step in and, um, and advocate for that young person um, to access the care they need, um, which, which can involve the legal system. Um, and I'm not sure if you want to go into it, um, but in Australia we have a pretty complicated history around um, uh, regulation of, of hormone treatment, which has involved the Family Court of Australia. Um, in 2004, there was a case of a trans boy who uh, presented to our hospital, actually. He presented to the Royal Children's Hospital um, after being abandoned by his family and because he was trans. And he was very suicidal 
he knew exactly what he needed and he was um, specifically asking to, to transition medically and surgically. Um, and he was only 12. Um, and this is at a time where Australia didn't, um, we didn't have um, a history of, of, of intervening um, with providing medical care for trans people. And it was um, the, the doctors in, in the hospital here at the time uh, who, who went international with their, um, with their research into, into what was best for this young person. And, and in, um, in the UK, in the US and um, predominantly actually in the Netherlands, in, in um, looking at uh, Europe, uh, they recommended the, the, um, the pathway down puberty suppression and, and gender affirming hormone treatment for this young person. But because uh, this, um, this boy was um, living in the care of the state, um, he was in foster care at the time, um, he didn't have anyone who could provide consent for him and he wasn't old enough to provide his own consent. So it went to court um, where the court was um, given the responsibility of making that medical decision for him for treatment that was considered novel in Australia back at that time, uh, 17 years ago. And that decision in the court was um, uh, to allow this boy to start puberty blockers and to start hormone treatment. And eventually, actually, the court also approved uh, top surgery for him, chest reconstruction surgery, um, because his puberty blockers were starting uh, a little bit later than um, it had some onset of puberty. But in the judgment from that, that case, it's known as re Alex, the, the judge um, made a comment that all young people uh, needed to have court approval for hormone treatment because it was considered. Um, uh, at that time, it was it was considered a treatment that required that level of of oversight. So something and I, more more than parental consent. Oh, more than parental consent. Yes. So from yeah, so from two thousand and four until two thousand and seventeen, so a very long period of time in Australia, what we had was a situation where even if the young person. Um, uh, was consenting to hormone treatment and they knew it was in their best interest, even if the doctors looking after them felt the same way, and if both parents also agreed that it was the right thing, they were still required to, to go to court. Um, and this was an extraordinary, um, uh, well, I would see it as a, as a breach of their human rights, um, that we know that these young people uh, are needing this treatment, it's potentially life-saving treatment, it's therapeutic, it helps their lives so much, and yet there were delays, there was pathologization within the court process, there was a lot of extra distress that was totally unnecessary. And there have been a series of court cases to, um, to uh, try and overcome this, this hurdle with the, with the court involvement that have been um, mostly successful and um, there was a big case known as Re Jamie that provided the first jump for uh, puberty blockers to come out of this system, and then Re Kelvin um, that I was involved in, and, and the Royal Children's Hospital intervened with the federal government of Australia and the Australian Human Rights Commission. We all intervened in this case and um, managed to overturn this law, which was a really significant step in um, in Australia for trans rights. We've had a little minor step backwards um, with a recent case with a single judge um, that happened in 2020. And the situation at the moment is that we can prescribe puberty suppression and gender affirming hormone treatment with the consent of both parents. But should uh, one parent object or not provide consent, then we still need to go through a court process. Um, and what's interesting, Coleman, is that in the 17 years that we've had this involvement of the court, there's been um, uh, at least 90 cases, probably now about 100 cases that have gone through the court, and not once has the court denied a young person uh, gender-affirming treatment. Interesting. Um, yeah, and of course no one goes to court unless they're very much sure mm. and determined that it's right for them and going through court processes stressful and right um and and takes a lot of 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 courage and and strength 
Um, but not once has a judge said, no, I'm, I'm sorry, you, you can't have it uh, every single case. So it's it has felt like an unnecessary burden on the system, um, I have to say. Um, and we've seen these, we've seen um, similar kind of moves uh, in the UK recently um, with a case that was later overturned on appeal. Um, uh, and also in the US, there are a number of states now who are trying to legislate to restrict treatment for trans young people. And it's interesting having gone through this process in Australia um, and coming out the other side with a better situation, I look to the US and, and worry about the outcome for these young people who are going to be denied treatment or have treatment delayed until adulthood, because I know that the cost of doing so is so great. So what would you say to someone who is in, is in the position on, you know, on one side of the just gender dysphoria spectrum where they're just very certain and have been since they can remember that they, they were assigned the wrong gender, and yet they know that their parents, either for religious, political, or other reasons, are totally unpersuadable? Um, what, what do you say to such a person? Mm, that's a difficult one. Um, I would show my sense of empathy for how difficult it is for them as a starting point. I think acknowledging that that situation is really awful um, and, um, and incredibly distressing, um, just voicing that is, is helpful from that very first moment. Um, and then trying to work through ways that they can, um, uh, if their parents are absolutely um, immovable on this, um, it's really about supporting that young person to survive um, and to, to get through to a stage where legally they can make their own decisions about this and, um, and to do so independently once they reach adulthood. Mm. Um, but it's, I, I can't imagine actually how distressing that would be to have a parent not acknowledge who you are as their child. Um, and I think it comes to the heart of the need for children and young people to feel unconditional love. Um, I think I'm a parent, I've got two kids, and um, I can't imagine being in that situation where um, anything would get in the way of that. Um, so I, I think it really is probably one of the most challenging situations that we see. Um, because it's so distressing, it's distressing for the clinicians looking after these young people. So um, if you magnify that a million times, that's we, we understand how that young person must be feeling too. Yeah. So um, going back a little bit uh, to more of the sort of specifics. So if you get you know, puberty blockers and then hormone therapy, what are the effects on one's ability to have biological children? Yeah. Uh, so it depends on your sex assigned at birth. Um, if you are born um, an assigned female at birth, then testosterone treatment probably has some effect on reducing your fertility. Uh, but over time, we're realising that it has less effect than we thought it did. Um, and whilst we provide lots of counselling around um, fertility preservation, uh, we've started to do a lot more counselling around contraception um, for, the, for the trans boys because there has been this sense in the past that testosterone, because it can induce um, amenorrhea or stopping people's periods, that they couldn't get pregnant um, if they were taking testosterone. And in Australia, we have Medicare uh, 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 data that, um, and on, Medi on your Medicare card, you can change your gender uh, to uh, match your your um, gender identity, or you can change your sex to match your gender identity. So it's a it's a situation where trans men are represented in Medicare as, as men and we can look at Medicare data and see just how many men are accessing 
um, uh, termination services, birthing services. Um, next door to our hospital is the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne and they um, have um, services for trans men who, who are giving birth um, or who are or terminating pregnancies. Well, actually, I don't know if they do it there, but they, you, they do have termination services in Victoria where trans men are experiencing unwanted pregnancies. And um, this gives us, you know, an indication that actually fertility is not as um, affected as what, what might have been um, felt in the past. And what we do also see now are a larger number of trans men who are planning pregnancies with their partner and whether they're um, uh, using, you know, sperm for, from what, whatever means, whether it's IVF or from their partner, um, we're seeing more and more trans men obviously coming off testosterone because you can't be on testosterone and um, have normal development of the fetus. So they're provided with advice about stopping testosterone, conceiving, and then going through a regular pregnancy and delivering um, the baby and um, potentially going back on testosterone after they've delivered the baby, depending on what they want to do um, in terms of feeding and so forth. But there are um, a number of Australian men who have gone online and, and documented their, their pregnancy journeys. Um, we're aware of someone who's had three children coming on and off testosterone over time to have those children with very normal, healthy um, children at that. So for the trans men, there are lots of options. Um, and as I said, we counsel about fertility as much as we counsel about contraception, making sure we don't have unwanted pregnancies. For the trans women, um, it's a bit of a different story because we know that estrogen affects spermatogenesis and um, many uh, um, trans women um, may also go on to have uh, surgery where their testes are removed um, later on. So before we start any treatment, whether it's puberty suppression or gender affirming hormone treatment, we have um, quite detailed fertility preservation discussions. And it really depends on the age of that young person, how we go about that, um, that discussion and uh, what can be offered. So for example, if you have someone who comes to us and they're 15 or 16 and they're identifying as female and they want to start on estrogen, they can, uh, some of them um, are very happy to produce a sperm sample um, which uh, they can store that sperm for 20, 30 years and should they want children down, down the track, they can utilise that through IVF services, for example. So we encourage them if they do want to um, preserve their fertility uh, to do so through, um, through what we call cryopreservation of their sperm. For those who come to us who are much younger, so for example, if we had someone who was presenting at um, age nine or 10, who uh, was going to go on to puberty blockers before they have gone through um, their endogenous puberty, usually what happens is that um, unfortunately the time that you start producing mature sperm is also the time that your voice deepens, which is usually the greatest fear. Um, and they're wanting to start puberty suppression to avoid that voice deepening. So what we do um, in that situation is we, we talk through the options of waiting uh, to start puberty suppression a bit later. Usually they choose not to do that because they don't want their voice deepening. So we can start them on um, puberty suppression. But what we offer at that time is, um, is a testicular biopsy. This isn't offered um, in many different places, but here at the Royal Children's, we're very fortunate to have um, a general surgical team and a team with the fertility preservation um, uh, system so that what we can do is a testicular biopsy, take that testicular tissue. Um, sometimes if it's late enough, they might have sperm within that tissue we can, we can utilise. Um, but if there are no sperm there, we can freeze that testicular tissue and, um, and preserve it as well for the future. 
Um, and whilst this is entirely, um, uh, it's under a research protocol and it's entirely um, experimental, um, what we know is with technology over time, it might be a way that we could allow that young person to have biological children down the track. Oh, um, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So where we're at at the moment is that um, many young children um, or and their parents uh, choose not to have that procedure because obviously we need a general anaesthetic and they go mm-hmm. through theatre and, and um, then we have to freeze that tissue and, and store it for a long period of time and that can be confronting in itself um, and they choose not to do that. But for others, even if the chance that that might be successful is extraordinarily small, for them from a psychological perspective it's been important to maximise their options uh, as much as they can and they feel that it's helpful for them um, in that sense. Um, yeah, it's interesting. We, as time goes on, there's, I think, um, snippets of, of information that suggest that oestrogen doesn't uh, necessarily um, make someone infertile. That was the assumption initially. Um, there are reports that there is preservation despite, some preservation despite oestrogen. But I think always when we're counselling young people on uh, the risks and benefits of treatment, we have to present it in a realistic way and say, look, it could um, mean infertility um, and um, the options for this may be very limited in the future. But what's interesting, um, Coleman, is um, that along with that discussion we had initially about how transitioning is often not a choice, that these young people feel so strongly about who they are and who they need to be, that Fertility is just one factor in so many different factors that they think about when they're transitioning. Um, And a couple of people have said to me um, in the past when they've been talking about fertility and and talking about the counselling that we provide about their long-term options is that we come from quite a heteronormative position where um, we think about families and children um, as something that may be kind of universally desired, but in the LGBTIQ plus community, um, it uh, various factors have different weight. Um, and for some of us, um, I think what we've learned is that, again, we just really need to listen to the young person about what they want, what they need, and to prioritise things um, individually for that young person and taking into account their parents' wishes as well. well. This is a this is a tricky one because I can very easily imagine a 12-year-old that knows that they're in the wrong body and and is right about that. Yeah. But uh you know I think you know if I just think of all of my cisgender friends who I you know I I'm sometimes the odd person out in that I've known that I want to have children since I was 18 or 19. And that's been a stable desire of mine. But, you know, most people I know are just at my age of 25, sort of on the fence. And I think half of them are going to go one way and half of them are going to go the other. And it's, it's one of these decisions that really can come on like a light switch when you're 30. Um, you know, like for, for me, it came on like a light switch when my mother died is when I realized Mm -hmm. from total neutrality, not thinking about it, that I did want to have kids. And so it was like a a life event like that can, can, you know, and and this is something it's actually probably very tough for a young person to, in some ways tougher than your gender identity to, to know what you're going to want 20 years on. Um, yeah. so, you know, if, if there's some crazy, almost sci-fi way you could, you could preserve the ability, that would be, that would be an, a, a hugely valuable, just tech solution to this problem. But, but as you say, you know, if it's, if you're an adolescent or a child and it's a matter of survival, essentially, it's a matter of, I can't bear to live like this then that's when these these trade-offs you know the trade-off is sort of irrelevant if you're not alive to to uh to to make it there so 
it's um I suppose it's it's one of these situations where the the first directive is to make sure a person survives through adolescence and and to deal with all of the complications that may or may not result after you've you've taken care of number one. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you, Common. And and um that's where it takes us as as clinicians, as, as doctors to ensure that we've provided um, as many options as we can um, and to, it's often the parents who are, uh, I guess, most willing to um, to embark on procedures that um, have no guarantees about fertility that provide a potential chance for the future. Um, and um, it's they're often very interesting discussions because it is hard for a 12 year old. I mean, as, as you say, um, who's, who's thinking about kids when they're 12. Um, uh, but it is, it's a matter of, um, weighing up the nuance and, um, providing opportunity as much as you can without doing the harm, um, that can come from enforcing views on, on, on families. So, uh, just one or two more topics here before I, before I let you go. So let's talk about the, the, the phenomenon of, of detransitioning, which, uh, just refers to when someone gets hormone therapy or surgery and then later, uh, regrets it and wants to, wants to reverse it. So in preparation for this, I, I just looked at some of the studies on this and, you find credible studies saying that as little as, you know, less than 1% of people ever regret and want to detransition. And I see other studies that, that give numbers like eight or 9%. Um, so what is your experience? Uh, what, what's your direct experience with, with this phenomenon in people? So we, um, we have similar rates of detrans. I mean, it's hard for us to, to, contemplate the long term and and because we deal with a pediatric service um so in terms of looking at detransition in the future there are some questions around you know how far how far do we look uh beyond um our service to work out those numbers um and we've uh embarked on a longitudinal cohort study known as trans 20 where we've um uh recruited 630 young trans people and their families and we're following them um, uh, hopefully for 20 years hence the ambitious um, the name of our study trans 20 is is wanting to look 20 years into the future and that study was started in 2017 with a pilot and then commenced um, uh, in its current form in 2018 so we're we're only, only a short way into the future with that but um, in terms of our uh, the rates of regret um, that we're seeing, it is less than one percent um, in our cohort, and it's consistent with um, the studies. I'm not sure if you came across the one uh, that was done from the Amsterdam cohort, which looked at their uh, um, the people that went through their trans services from 1975 to 2015. Mm. So they had more than six thousand. Uh, people from adolescence through to um, late adulthood and their detransition rate was, um, or regret rate, I should say, was 0.3 to 0.6%. So um, depending on uh, birth to sign sex, a very low percentage. Um, and what was also really interesting with this study um, was that of those people that experienced regret, so even at that really low level, um, half of them expressed regret from the social impact of their transition. So they didn't regret the treatment because their gender identity changed down the track. What they did was regret the impact that that transition had on their life, whether it was rejection from their family, whether it was the fact they lost their job or they couldn't get employment. And... Um, 
they, um, yeah, they, they experience regret in that sense. There's another interesting study that was released this year by someone called Jack Turbin. Uh, he's from the US. I'm not sure if he came across that study, but he looked at um, at people who detransition um, in a cohort of, um, I think they started out with 27,000 trans people um, and looked at those who detransition and then um, retransition. Um, so we also have to think about when we when we look at regret, especially with social regret, that we recognise that, that that regret comes from uh, multiple factors. And in uh, Turbin's work, what he found was that of those who de detransitioned and retransitioned, that 80, I think it was 87% of the people um, that were included in the study in, in these circumstances talked about this, the external factors around their detransition and retransition. Again, family rejection, unemployment, um, or discrimination in, in the workplace or other environments. Um, and um, I think the the issue of of detransition and regret is really complicated um, because every story is different. Um, and some of the factors around um, regret um, can be uh, can be can be subtle, can be invisible in terms of the support that that person might be getting. Um, when um, uh, when we have these discussions about uh, about regret and detransition, there's a, often a lot of anxiety, um, and and I totally understand that. And with every young person that comes to see us, it's the one thing that we really um, strongly consider in our assessments over time is is this going to be the right thing for this person? Um, are they going to benefit from this in the long term? Or are they going to look back and think, I should have done it differently? So we keep that in mind the whole time. And um, when, um, when we talk about risk benefit, of course, there is always a risk of regret or a risk of detransition. But if we withhold treatment because we are worried about regret or detransition, then we deny 99% of people who will benefit from hormone treatment that treatment, which can be life-saving. Um, I had a discussion with someone the other day. It was actually in terms of um, uh, one of my friends who's a surgeon and we were talking about um, that regret and detransition. And I, I, I certainly don't want to diminish the, the trans experience. We're talking about a surgical procedure. Um, they're, they're totally, you know, apples and oranges. Um, but it did bring a point where... Um, where uh, we, we can kind of consider for uh, for an example something like elective joint replacements, and um, if you've got pain in your hip and you need a new hip, um, there might be a, a, a one percent uh, risk that you might get an infection in your hip, or you might die from sepsis, or have a have a complication from the anaesthetic, or what have you. But you don't stop doing hip replacements because of that 1%. You don't deny the 99% of people who will benefit in terms of removal of their pain in the longer term, the operation. But when we talk about trans treatment, there's this emotional aspect to the discussion, which I totally understand. But with the politicisation plus the emotional element, the detransition argument, I think, can become... Um, uh, it can become difficult to put in perspective because whilst it may seem like um, a, bad, a very, very, you know, unfortunate or, or in, some time, in, in some ways terrible situation for someone to regret that treatment, um, for the other 99.5% or how many uh, others are experiencing um, a positive benefit, you, you, you cannot deny them that opportunity it's not humane it's 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 not right um, so again it's complicated there's nuance and we need to be really thoughtful in how we approach it yeah and no, I, I think the uh the hip replacement analogy uh, obviously it's it's relevant in the sense that uh you don't deny the treatment 
But what you do do is just make sure that every protocol is being yeah. taken to minimize the 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 number of people that you know die from sepsis. You you know the surgeons scrub their hands, yeah. and there's a there's a checklist. And I think one of the people reason one of the reasons people have anxiety about the the detransitioning issue and you know fight about the rates of it is because the uh, the the process by which someone is you know a, a trans person is um, sort of, sort of it's decided whether they can get hormone therapy is not doesn't feel transparent. People don't know really what goes on. They they worry that in the worst case, um, you know, some rogue non expert at school is brainwashing your kid, and after one meeting, they're getting you know hormone therapy and it, they haven't, it's like the, the opposite of the extremely responsible, ethical, holistic approach that you've painted out and that you're doing. It's people worry that in some places that's happening. Now, I don't know to, yeah. to what extent that is true, but that, that, that could be a, a, a totally false caricature. It could be, there probably are some horror stories as there always are. Mm. Um, but in general, what what I would just say is like the the holistic nature of of what you're doing at this clinic is so so crucial and important. And you know the fact that you're having consultations and uh, you know dealing with all aspects, uh, just having conversations, and it's not it's not just uh, you know I think I think that's a crucial takeaway for for people that are curious about what's going on in this space and what should be going on and what should be the standard for the, for the world as, as we in the 21st century come into this, what is a relatively new issue for the mainstream to be discussing is like, what, what is, what are best practices? What is standard of care? Yeah. You know, it has to be this whole holistic, you know, dealing with a full person, not just, not just medical, uh, one size fits all solutions. And, um, I think you, you, you know, the, the work you're doing is a, is a beautiful shining example of that. Thank you, Coleman. Coleman, I don't know if you're aware of, um, of, of our Australian standards of care and how they came about. Um, but it links in with our discussion about the involvement of the court, um, from 2004, and when we were doing the advocacy to change the, the legal system to allow better access for trans youth to get hormone treatment, one of the questions that kept coming up when we were discussing this with the politicians, um, as well as those who work within the court, the judges that we met with and, and the lawyers, was that if the court doesn't have oversight into the, the care that's provided, if the court's not... Um, a form of governance that care is being provided in a holistic way, then what will the governance be? And um, it was in response to those questions that my team and I felt that um, what was out there internationally in terms of standards of care didn't fit with what we needed in Australia. Um, there are international guidelines uh, that have been written by the World Professional Association for Trans Health, for example, um, they are coming out with a new version, but when we were in the midst of this advocacy between uh, about 2013 and 2017, um, those guidelines were, um, were essentially out of date with regards to our Australian system. So we decided to write our own standards of care um, and it was quite a process. Um, my team led it. Um, but we involve clinicians from across Australia, which is, um, has a number of specialist paediatric gender services. Uh, we involve clinicians from New Zealand, uh, part of our region, and looked at the research and, and developed um, with, in, in collaboration, and, and when I mean with, I mean uh, side by side with trans young people and their parents, we designed and wrote these um, these guide, guidelines, which are called the Australian Standards of Care and Treatment Guidelines. 
and we had them published in the Medical Journal of Australia and um, they were undertaken for the reason of providing clinical governance and to set the standard for the country to allow the court to step back from the mechanism of ensuring good care. Um, but what ended up happening is um, the Lancet uh, actually contacted me two weeks after we'd had this published and, um, and said, we've looked at your standards of care and we, we think that, I actually used the term on, on, on email. They said, we think they're gold standard. And I have to tell you, I nearly fell off my chair because that's like, I thought this is the pinnacle of my career. I'm never going to get an email from the Lancet again. <laughs> <laughs> that's been unsolicited. Um, but uh, a couple of weeks later, they wrote an editorial. So they did their homework as the Lancet, you would expect from the Lancet. And they wrote this beautiful editorial about gender affirming care and and the the need for for um, holistic multidisciplinary input to provide best outcome. Um, but also um, uh, I took um, some of the uniqueness of our standards of care uh, at the time um, around the collaboration with the trans community to make sure that we really were meeting the needs um, uh, of those that we care for the most um, and that we're at the forefront of change because I think as cisgender clinicians like myself, um, unless you are integral to that community, unless you are working so strongly with that community, it's very easy to lose touch with what's important um, to them and, and things are changing in a way that um, can be hard for people to, cut, to keep up with if you're not really much, uh, really um, kind of ingrained um, with what's happening on the ground. Um, so we started this um, this work and this collaborative work, and we've 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 uh, extended this collaboration with the community into our research, uh, into our clinical practices. We've involved them in our uh, in our policy making and in our um, latest proposal to government. I mentioned at the very beginning that the Victorian government has um, just announced twenty one million dollars of uh, of of funding for trans young people in our state. Um, in American dollars, it's not quite 21 million, but um, can't do that quick calculation in my head. It's probably about 17 million US dollars um, investment. And that investment has come through this proposal, which involves uh, trans children, parents, um, and uh, services uh, that, that work in collaboration with us outside of the tertiary hospital system. Um, so it's it's a whole of community approach as well as a multidisciplinary approach, and I think it works beautifully. I'm very proud of it, actually. Yeah, as you should be. I, I really, I hope every trans kid in the world has access to an institution <laughs> like this where they can just go and say, "Yeah, waiting list might be a disaster if yeah. that's the case, Coleman." But uh, yeah. thanks very much. I appreciate yeah. the endorsement. So before I let you go, is there any website you can direct people to to learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, sure. So the Royal Children's Hospital has uh, a gender service website and it has links to all the organisations that we work with as well as the Australian Standards of Care and Treatment Guidelines. So if you Google RCH gender service, it comes up number one. And there's a lovely video there which um, has the trans kids talking about their experience of our service and um, I think the voices of trans young people are are uh, the most important when understanding their experience. So I'd encourage people to check out the website and uh, see what you think. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time, Michelle. Thanks, Coleman. It's been a pleasure. If you appreciate the work I do, the best ways to support me are to subscribe directly through my website, colemanhughes.org, and to subscribe to my YouTube channel so you'll never miss my new content. As always, thanks for your support.